I will be talking about the missing soldiers of World War I uh, today. And this is a presentation I've given on a, a couple of occasions, but it's made, and it is quite an emotional topic, but it's, and it's made all the more poignant, really, by Her Majesty's passing yesterday. So um, please uh, uh, bear with me if I have to collect my thoughts from time to time. Um, just a little bit about me. Um, I am a medical doctor, and I got interested in genealogy after my mother passed away, and my dad was left uh, alone in the family home, and he'd been doing genealogy on and off for 30 years, and I suggested to him, why don't we do a few projects together? And um, within months, I was addicted to genealogy, and I discovered during the course of my research that several of my own family members fought in World War I, and uh, they... Um, one of them died, one of them deserted, and one of them uh, survived. So uh, I have the whole gamut of experiences of World War I. But a million people were killed, over a million men and about 800 women were killed in action. And uh, of these, 526,816 are still missing. And... 187,000 of them are buried, but in unknown graves, so a soldier known unto God. And that means that 338,000 are not buried. And those 338,000 uh, soldiers are somewhere, more likely, most of them would be on the Western Front somewhere. And every year, uh, this, the, this information is taken from uh, March 2009 from the Commonwealth War Graves Commission and it reported these particular figures, and there's the, the figure for those that are not buried at all. And because of the fact that they're not buried, um, every year about 30 to 60 sets of remains are found on the Western Front. And this is an example of uh, a find that made the newspapers back in 2016. 19 sets of remains were recovered, two of them were German, nine of them were Commonwealth, but at that point in time only two of them had been identified. And the Western Front, you know, if, if we are, if we were to, just to give you an idea of how, of uh, the magnitude of the situation, if we were to recover 30 sets of remains per year, it would take us over a thousand years to actually recover everybody. So that just gives you a, a, a feeling for how uh, vast this particular uh, issue is. Now this is the Western Front extending from uh, Ostend in, in Belgium in the north, uh, down south and then across east towards uh, Germany, and then down south to the northern border of Switzerland. And this is where the remains of these World War I servicemen are being discovered. And there is this website on Google Maps that um, just kind of pinpoints uh, new discoveries as they occur. I don't think it's being kept up to date, but it actually is very difficult to get information about what uh, remains and what, what uh, finds are being made. Um, and it's very difficult to keep track of exactly uh, what um, new sets of remains are being discovered over the years. Now, when a set of remains is discovered um, and found, the local police will usually be called in. Um, this is either in France or in Belgium. And um, what I'll do is I'll sit down just to, so I don't keep on blocking people here. But um, the, the, the first thing they need to decide is, is this a recent death or is it um, uh, war remains? And uh, they will also be giving, uh, granting permission for particular people to recover those sets of remains. And the recovery is usually undertaken by the local army, uh, archaeologists, or maybe the original finder. Um, in Belgium, uh, it's by the police, and they provide a detailed report. But in France, the Commonwealth Wargrave Commission's exhumation officer is involved with the recovery. And the Commonwealth Wargraves Commission stores the remains in their mortuary and also secures uh, any artifacts that might be associated with the find um, artifacts found near the sets of remains. The primary purpose is, first of all, to identify the nationality of the, um, the, the soldiers, and the Commonwealth Wargraves Commission will report to the member government 
uh, Ministry of Defense. So in the UK, it's the Joint Compassionate Care Committee. In Germany, it's the VDK. Uh, in uh, the UK, the JCCC coordinates efforts to identify the soldier in terms of the nationality, in terms of the regiment, and in terms of naming the individual. And if the individual can be named, can be identified, then the family is traced and a funeral is organized for that particular soldier. The process for identifying the remains um, is coordinated by the Ministry of Defense, specifically the Service Personnel and Veterans Agency, and a subgroup of that, the JCCC, and a subgroup of that, the Historic Casualty and Deceased Estates Casework Team. And that was a two-person team, so there was only two people dealing with these 30 sets of remains every year up until about 2018. And thereafter, it was expanded to uh, seven people. And some of you may have seen, it's, it's an all-women uh, team. And you may have seen them on Long Lost Family, uh, the special episode that dealt with uh, World War I soldiers. Now, the kind of team that they use for recovering the remains could include a forensic archaeologist. So it's like, like a crime scene investigation, like recovery. Uh, they may also have a forensic anthropologist who will measure things like the height of the individual, any battle wounds or any distinguishing uh, features. You know, for example, if, if they have a, a false leg, uh, that would obviously be important. If they had a steel plate in the skull or in, in somewhere else, that would be important as well. But the team might also involve military historians who would be able to tell you what uh, regiment was moving around at a particular point in the war. There would be a photographer, a project manager, and ultimately they're trying to identify the nationality, the regiment, and the individual named soldier. Now there are three approaches to identification, and the first line approach is using non-DNA evidence. So that would be things like artifacts. Um, it would be things like the age, the height, the battle wounds, distinguishing features like we said previously, but also using paper records like the servicemen's records and war diaries, which would tell you where a particular regiment was at any particular time during the war. The second line of approach is to do forensic DNA testing. And the forensic DNA they use is exactly the same as they use for crime scene investigations. And that, I believe, is only used in selected cases. Not everybody gets their DNA tested. Um, but it's very difficult to know for sure what the process is because they, the Ministry of Defense do not publish that information. Now, the third line of approach, and this is a new line of approach because it hasn't been introduced to the UK as yet, and that is to use commercial DNA testing. You know, using, uh, there's a lot of people now, 14 million people in databases run by Ancestry, 23andMe, Family Tree DNA. A lot of people are getting them as Christmas presents. So there's 40 million people in these commercial databases. And two of these databases, which we will talk about later on, Family Tree DNA, FTDNA, or GEDmatch, they are, allow law enforcement agencies to use their databases to identify either unidentified human remains or perpetrators of violent crime. And we'll have a look at that later on in the presentation. But this is an example of some of the artifacts that are found. I mean, you, it ranges from a full tank, you see on the left-hand side, to um, uh, weapons. Um, trench digging shovels can distinguish a British from a German from a French soldier. Um, clothing, boots, they also can distinguish the nationality of a soldier. And buttons and insignias are very, very useful. And uh, here you can see the Royal Warwickshire Reg Regiment on the uh, bottom right hand side. So that can uh, tell you uh, and identify which regiment the soldier comes from. As far as dog tags are concerned, they were only introduced in August of 1914, but only as a single dog tag. The double dog tag system was not introduced until September 1916. And if memory serves me correctly, it was made from compressed cardboard. 
which does not stand the test of time a hundred years later on the Western Front. Now, the war records are quite interesting because most servicemen's whereabouts can be pinpointed if they are given a name, a regiment, and a date, because the war diaries are so specific that you can have a very clear picture of where a regiment was at any particular point in time during World War I. As far as servicemen's details are concerned, the Canadian and Australian records are very good, but unfortunately, the World War, records, World War I records for Britain uh, were bombed during World War II. And 70% of those servicemen's records were lost, so only 30% survive. But ultimately, the, the um, hope is that using uh, these approaches, uh, we will be able to identify a particular set of remains. But quite frequently, it isn't possible. And in that case, you get this kind of gravestone where you have this inscription at the bottom, known unto God. And there are many, many of those gravestones in the various military cemeteries all along the Western Front. Now, to illustrate how the process works in practice, I'm going to talk to you about the Fromel project. And there's a lot of information uh, online about this. Uh, what I am going to do is put together a handout, and I will email it to uh, Mick. I'll email you the link, Mick, and then you can circulate that to the... To, to people maybe who haven't uh, turned up tonight or uh, wanted to look at afterwards. And uh, that way you'll be able to, to uh, load, to click on any of these links and it'll take you to the relevant website. But the Fromel project was taken on in earnest by the Australian Army because, uh, and, and there's an excellent documentary about the process of finding the lost battalions of Fromel, and that was uh, done on Channel 4 in 2009. It's now available on YouTube, and most of the information I'm going to show you is from these two books that were published as a result of the Fromel project, uh, Remembering Fromel and Remember Me to All, and those are available on Amazon. But the Battle of Fromel happened on the 19th of July, 1916, it was a diversionary tactic to distract the Germans from the start of the Battle of the Somme. The trouble was, this was the third time the Battle of Fromel had been attempted, and it ended just as disastrously as it had the previous two times. It was the worst day in Australian military history, with 5,500 Australian casualties, 2,000 killed, 1,299 missing, and British casualties were 1,547, of whom 500 were killed. So it was a real disaster. And the sad thing is, of course, that very early on in the battle, uh, the Germans captured um, an officer who had all the battle plans on his person. So it was a, a failure on so many, so many fronts. But back in 2009, um, eight mass graves were discovered at Fromel, uh, beside Pheasant Wood, and here you see the uh, excavation of these eight mass graves, and you can read about how these were actually found in a fascinating, uh, it's a fascinating story that I don't have time to go into tonight, but there is a, fr a freely available issue of Wartime magazine that has a variety of different articles that explain how this retired school teacher from Australia, on his own, was able to find out that there was something wrong and he pinpointed uh, or helped to pinpoint where these mass graves were. Now, I'm not going to show any uh, human remains, obviously. Um, I'm just going to show photographs from the excavation. Uh, this one is just to show you that uh, they wore crime scene investigation-like uh, clothing um, to avoid contamination. And then they logged every single artifact that was found, and a chain of custody was established. So it was really just like a crime scene investigation. And these are some of the artifacts that they found, uh, just to give you an example of the sort of things that are found around these sets of remains from World War I. Uh, this were uh, a page from uh, the Bible, uh, the, a boot. This was a solid gold cross in a leather pouch. 
This one was either a compass or a pocket watch, and uh, on the back of it there is an inscription and it looks like Sherwood. And this could be used for identifying a soldier, but the trouble with these kind of artifacts is that you cannot guarantee that the person having the artifact is the person named on the inscription. The reason being that his friend could have died and he might have taken the watch to bring back to the family and then he was killed himself. This is a cardigan. This is a set of rosary beads. This is a uh, pouch with some coins. Matches. Um, this is a leather pouch that contained wire cutters, which every soldier in World War I would have had. And this is a return ticket to Perth, which uh, clearly was never used. So, all in all, 250 sets of remains were exhumed from this site at Fromel. And the, the DNA collection involved, first of all, having the DNA of everybody who worked on the project tested to eliminate them from any, you know, if there was any contamination from the people working on the project, they'd be able to recognize uh, their DNA immediately. And then tissue samples were collected from the sets of remains at the scene, supervised by what they call the SOCO, the scene of crime officer, and then transported to London to the laboratory, LGC Forensics. And then the viability of DNA extraction was determined. And if it was possible, then they went ahead and did it. And the sort of tissues they use would be either a tooth or a bone in most instances. And with modern sampling, we actually would use the petrous part of the temporal bone, which is just this hard part just behind your ear. Because it, as the name says, petrous is the Latin for rock. And that bone behind your ear is like rock. And it's very, very dense. And the, the yield of DNA you get from that particular bone is 400 times better than you usually get from a tooth. So that's what we would normally do today. But back then in 2009, that had not been discovered. Uh, the good news was that DNA was recovered successfully. It was present in very low quantities and very degraded, as you can imagine, after 100 years. Um, but it was sufficiently usable uh, to obtain Y-DNA and mitochondrial DNA, which are two different types of DNA. I'll talk about them briefly. Um, but how many Y you know, DNA markers were recovered is difficult to know. They probably just used a 17 marker test, because that would be the standard forensic test to use 17 DNA markers on the Y chromosome. And I have no idea how many markers they recovered from the mitochondrial DNA. Now, let's just look briefly at the three types of DNA test. If this is you down here, this is your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and so on going back. Y-DNA comes from the Y-chromosome. The Y-chromosome is what makes males males. So it's only passed from father to son. So it's very, very good for tracking back along the direct male line. Father, 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 father. What else comes down the direct male line? Apart from the Y-chromosome, the surname. So your surname comes down the direct male line as well. And that's why Y-DNA is an excellent tracker for the surname. On the other side of your family tree, you've got your mother, mother, mother line, the direct female line. But of course, the surname there changes every single generation as women change from their maiden name to their married name. So that is not quite as useful for, from genealogical point of view. Um, but for forensic, for the forensic testing they did on these soldiers, it does come in uh, very importantly. So just remember that Y-DNA goes back along the father-father-father line. Mitochondrial DNA goes back along the mother-mother-mother line. Now, mothers will pass it on to all of their children, but boys cannot pass on mitochondrial DNA. Only the daughters can pass on mitochondrial DNA. So all of us here in this room, men and women, will have mitochondrial DNA, but the men will not be able to pass it on to their children. Only the women can pass it on to their children. The third type of DNA is autosomal DNA, and this is the most useful if you're doing genealogy. Um, they did not use this at Fromel because the forensic tests they usually use are just Y-DNA and mitochondrial DNA. 
but certainly from a genealogy point of view, autosomal DNA would be the major test that we use. And Y-DNA and mitochondrial DNA are both good for deep as well as recent ancestry, and they've been used to um, track the migration of human beings out of Africa going back 250,000 years ago. So they're very, very uh, powerful uh, tools, this Y-DNA test and the mitochondrial DNA test. The autosomal test is really just good for recent ancestry and will take you back roughly to your great-great-great-great-grandparents, which is about and you have 64 of those. And that goes back to maybe the late 1700s, middle of the 1700s, that type of thing. So here we have 250 soldiers at Fromel. And if you just have DNA from the soldier and nothing to compare it to, it's essentially useless. So what you need to have is a comparative database. And what they knew was that the 250 soldiers at Fromel were probably some of the 1,650 named soldiers that were missing and that were on the various memorials um, that uh, were around, that were related to the Battle of Fromel. So the 250 recovered soldiers were likely to be somewhere on this list of 1,650. So what the team did, they traced the families of all 1,650 soldiers who were reported missing at the Battle of Fromel. And they were trying to identify what they called informative DNA donors. And a DNA donor could either be a Y DNA donor, somebody on the direct male line, father, 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 linking up with the, uh, with a, with the presumed soldier, and uh, two mitochondrial DNA samples, and those would be on the direct female line, mother, 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 going back to the soldier's mother. So in order to do this, they needed 6,600 donors in order to identify 250 soldiers. So it's another example of the magnitude of the undertaking that this team uh, took on. And here's how the, uh, the DNA donors would work. So for example, you have the soldier here, born about 1895, he would have been maybe 20 years old or in his late teens during uh, World War I when he signed up. And maybe he had brothers and they had sons who had sons. And it's those sons who would have been born around about 1955, still alive today. They would be perfect DNA donors for the Y DNA. On the mitochondrial DNA side, the soldier may have had sisters who had children who had children. And the direct female line coming down to roughly 1955 or so, those people, if they were still living, would be suitable DNA donors. And you see that both the men and the women could be DNA donors, but of course only the women would have passed the mitochondrial DNA down to the following generation. And if they didn't find um, DNA donors by going down from the brothers, of the uh, soldier, they would have to go back up to look for first cousins of the soldier. And if that didn't work, they'd have to go back up another generation and look for second cousins of the soldier. So there was a huge amount of work involved. And this uh, family tree building was done by volunteers. Now, what they then did was they were able to calculate a statistical measure you know, the question really was, uh, what is the probability that this DNA signature that we have found is the soldiers, indicates this particular soldier, or could it by chance be somebody else in the general population who is matching this particular signature? And these kind of probabilities were as high as maybe 1 in 1,950, 1, say 1, 1 in 2,000 for mitochondrial DNA, and 1 in 3,500 3, for Y DNA, but you can combine them and multiply the mitochondrial probability with the Y probability, and that can give you something like a probability of 1 in 6 million. <laughs> so that was what they were trying to do. They were trying to approach it from the Y DNA side and the mitochondrial DNA side to get this combined statistical measure that would get them into the millions. And therefore, they'd be able to say the DNA is saying that it's a million to one 
it's somebody else other than the soldier that we think it is. And the type of statistics they used were exactly the same kind of uh, methods that they used to identify Richard III in the car park in Leicester. So just imagine for a moment, how long would it take you to trace your grandfather's family back three generations to his great-grandparents, born about 1800? Maybe a day, if you were lucky and you were pretty quick. But then, once you got to him, how long would it take you to trace all of the living descendants today from your great-grandfather? You know, it may be two days. Multiply that by 1,650, and you've got 13 and a half years. <laughs> so that is the amount of time that these volunteer genealogists put into building the family trees for these 1,650 people. Now, the good news is that they were, when it came to tracing living relatives, um, they managed to, to actually trace living relatives in, in all but a very small number of cases. Uh, in some cases, the family had just gone extinct. There were no survivors. They'd all died several generations previously. Or perhaps there were no informative DNA donors among the surviving uh, people of that particular family. And in very rare cases, less than 1%, the family was unwilling to donate DNA. Uh, sometimes they thought it was a scam. You know, when the, when the MOD team phoned up and said, oh, you've got a potential World War I relative and we want to test your DNA, uh, people would have thought, no, oh, this, this sounds pretty dodgy. And some people just refused to be involved. Um, and they only collected Y-DNA and mitochondrial DNA for this particular exercise. And the other thing to note is that in about 1% to 2% of the population, your father is not who you think he is. Because there is an adoption, a secret adoption, a secret illegitimacy, a secret infidelity. And um, that you know, is well documented. It's about 1% to 2% of, of uh, per generation will have that. And, you know, I have adoptions in, in my family tree. Um, and certainly when I bought my first DNA test, I thought, oh, actually, I'll, I'll give it to my dad for, for Christmas because um, whatever he gets will apply to me. And then I thought, how do I know he's my father? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I said, happy Christmas, dad, and hoped for the best. <laughs> so the identification process involved a data analysis team chaired by Professor Margaret Cox, also co-chair Peter Jones, and then various subject matter experts. And that subject could be anthropology, archaeology, molecular genetics, military history, uh, records, or statistics. And they, uh, this data analysis team would review the data and then make a recommendation to the Joint Identification Board, who would either decide to accept the identification suggested by the data analysis team. We think this is private so-and-so. The, the JIB would decide whether or not to the evidence was compelling enough to accept that identification. In parallel, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission would check against its database that the soldier identified had not already been buried in a grave. And in only one case, was it found that somebody who had been identified by the Fromel team had been incorrectly identified on a previous war grave, and that was changed. So only in one case. Following the acceptance of the identification, that uh, ID would be passed to the relevant government minister, the family of that soldier would be notified, and the media would be informed. Now, the standards they used for identification, in terms of identifying what army the soldier belonged to, they used the balance of probabilities. But in terms of identifying the individual, they wanted clear and convincing evidence that indicates that an identification is substantially more likely than not. So it is a much higher standard that they required for identifying the individual. So just a question to everybody in the audience then. How often do you think an identification was possible only using non-DNA evidence? Was it 10%? Was it 50%? Was it 90%? How many people think 90%? How many people think 50%? How many people think 
Okay, well, you were close. The answer is 0%. Zero. Without DNA, no identifications would have been made at Fromel. Because the data analysis team first met in 2010, and there was no DNA available, and all they could make was three tentative identifications for three soldiers based on the non-DNA evidence, like an inscribed watch or an inscribed ring, for example. <clears throat> So no positive identifications were uh, uh, possible without DNA. The other thing to remember is that at Fromel, the soldiers were only wearing one dog tag. And that ta dog tag was removed by the Germans and given to the Red Cross, so it could be sent home to inform the families that the soldier had died. But then the soldier was left without any form of identification. So there was little evidence left to identify the soldier. But a new cemetery was built at Pheasant Wood. This is the last military cemetery built for World War I. And it was built at Pheasant Wood. The last burial of these 250 soldiers occurred in 2010. And of course, at that stage in 2010, uh, none of them had been identified. But as DNA became available and more uh, informative DNA donors were found to build the comparative DNA database. 75 were identified by 2011, 150 by 2016, 159 by 2018, and 166 by 2019. So that still leaves 84 out of the 250 soldiers that have not been identified. And as each one of those soldiers was identified, my understanding is that people would go into the, the groundsmen would go into the cemetery, they would locate the grave where that soldier was buried, they would remove this, the, the gravestone saying, known unto God, and they would replace it with a gravestone with the soldier's name on it. So the lessons from Fromel is that without DNA, there was no identification. Without genealogists volunteering their time, there would have been no families to test because they wouldn't have been traced. That's 13 and a half years of work. And it kind of raises the question, are we adequately harnessing the power of the genealogy community to assist in the identification process? We had 1,650 families that had to be, had a family tree built we had to uh, try and identify 6,600 donors, and that was to identify 250 soldiers. So a huge undertaking, and the identification process is still ongoing. You can see how every year there's another couple of soldiers identified, and the following year another handful of soldiers identified, and that will go on, um, as far as I know, indefinitely. But certainly since 2014, it's the, only the Australian government that is giving funding to this particular project. Because there's so many Australian soldiers that were, um, that were killed at Fromel. Now, one of the comments in the book, Remember Me to All, uh, struck me. And it says, in order to establish a familial link, it is essential to locate living genetic relatives from, if possible, both their maternal and paternal lines. Without living relatives, it is extremely difficult to match the DNA of a buried soldier to that of the family of a missing soldier, as the buried soldier's DNA profile, without an external reference, is simply an anonymous signature. And I've underlined without an external reference because now, with genetic genealogy, we potentially have that external reference. And that's the Y-DNA and mitochondrial DNA databases at Family Tree DNA, which is one of the companies that allows law enforcement agencies to use their customer database for identifying unidentified human remains in the USA but also their autosomal DNA database at Family Tree DNA and a similar one at a website called GEDmatch. And Family Tree DNA have roughly about, I would say, one and a half to two million people in their autosomal DNA database. GEDmatch have about 1.5 million people in their DNA database. And those are the ones that are being used for identifying uh, perpetrators of violent crime in America. 
And that's what we come on to now, the third potential line of approach. And you can put a question mark uh, after that because it's not being used currently in the UK. It is being used in the US, it has been used in Sweden, it's being under investigation in Australia, and um, it probably is only a matter of time before we have this type of approach as a third line of approach to identification in the UK. And this uh, uses commercial DNA, also called direct-to-consumer DNA, because you, me, anyone, we can just go online, we can buy a DNA kit, and we can uh, buy our own DNA and get our own DNA results. But it's only FTDNA and GEDmatch that have databases that allow you, uh, that allow, are allowed to be used for law enforcement process uh, purposes or for identifying unidentified human remains. Now this table just summarizes the key differences between the forensic DNA tests and the commercial DNA tests. And really what I want to draw attention to is the number of markers used. With the forensic tests, it's usually less than 30. With the commercial tests you get from Ancestry and all of the commercial companies, it is 600,000. So that is another order of magnitude difference between the forensic and the commercial. Yes, question Does that here. 23andMe for the commercial DNA That's tests? right. That's right. So Ancestry, MyHeritage, 23andMe, Family Tree DNA, they all use the same microchip for doing this DNA testing, and that will assess 600,000 SNP markers on your autosomal DNA. So it is a huge order of magnitude. You know, it is, what, 20,000 times more markers than the standard forensic one. Now, there are other differences as well, but the commercial uh, tests will have a much greater reach. They can take you out to maybe fifth cousin, whereas the forensic ones could only do maybe aunt, uncle, nephew, niece reliably. When you get to first cousins, they have maybe a 1% chance of being definitive that this is a first cousin relationship. And certainly I've seen... Um, the results come back from a forensic test saying that these two people are first cousins, these two people are first cousins too, rather than half-siblings, when in fact it was half-siblings. So a half-sibling relationship, uh, they could not distinguish between a half-sibling relationship and a first cousin relationship. But genetic genealogy has been helping adoptees find their biological family since 2009, and this was my first client, Winnie. And... Um, uh, she said, I heard you can help me. Um, I said, do the DNA test. I'm off to Trinidad uh, for my holidays. Uh, send me an email when you get the results. And I came back, uh, and six weeks after that, she sent uh, an email saying, I got my results, and it looks like I've got a first cousin. And I looked at her results, and uh, she'd actually found a half-nephew, and the match's mother was her half-sister. And they were reunited um, very, very quickly, and she was welcomed into the fold. And you get a lot of these stories uh, over the, you know, online. You can see a lot of them. And all of this work has been helped by Facebook groups like DNA Detectives, which has over 115,000 members, and Search Squad, which has over 77,000 members. And these are manned by volunteers who will help you solve an adoption mystery, um, an unknown father mystery. So it really is a, a big example of how crowdsourcing is, is really making a huge impact on um, helping adoptees solve their adoption mysteries. And it just goes to show if the genealogy community is mustered in the right way that they could actually be very, very useful and helpful. Now, these techniques for, uh, for looking at adoptees started in 2009. It was in 2018 that we realized that um, they could also be used for identifying unidentified human remains. And the first example was this poor 21-year-old uh, girl who was found murdered on the side of the highway in Ohio. And for 30 years, they had not been able to identify who she was. But within four hours of getting the results from her commercial DNA test, they were able to, to, to identify her. So it took 
genetic genealogy is just four hours to identify this individual. And then two weeks after that, this person here in the middle was arrested, and that is the Golden State Killer. And he was responsible for something like 50 rapes, uh, 20 murders, over an extended period in California. Um, it really hit the headlines. And since then, over 200 perpetrators of violent crime have been identified uh, using these genetic genealogy techniques that we first developed for adoptees. And these just really give a tip or a lead. You know, we're basically telling the police, we think it's this person here. And then the police do their standard police procedure, collect DNA using forensic DNA testing, and it's the forensic DNA that will be used in court to convict the perpetrator. So in, how could this be used if um, some soldiers' remains are found? Well, if the regiment was identified from maybe an insignia or an artifact with the uh, set of remains, then potentially we could just look at all the families of regiments missing soldiers. And then these families could be traced and DNA tested, but that would be quite costly. Um, but there is a shortcut we can narrow it down by a variety of different methodologies. For example, assessing for surname candidates and then finding cousins on GEDmatch. So let's look at those. First of all, the assessment of surname candidates. You remember that I said that the Y-DNA is a very useful marker for tracking the surname. So for example, you know, I do my DNA and my name is Gleason and all of my matches are called Gleason. So it's a very, very useful way of finding out what the surname of an unidentified person might be. And if you're a male adoptee and you do your Y-DNA test, it can tell you the likely surname of your biological father. So this is a very useful technique for um, getting a clue, a surname clue. And then, of course, you could check these surnames against the regimental list and see if there was anyone with that surname in the regiment at the time, and then trace their family, and just narrow down the focus to those families, identify uh, informative DNA donors from those families, and um, that would really help reduce the cost. And that way you could identify um, uh, a particular soldier, targeted testing of that soldier's relatives. The other way that we could use is by using the autosomal DNA on those two websites I mentioned, GEDmatch and Family Tree DNA, using this exact same technique as we use for adoptees. And it's a well-established methodology, and many genetic genealogists are experienced in using it, and it's the technique that has been adapted for use by law enforcement in the USA. Um, the methodology in brief is, first of all, you find close cousins, you look at their family trees, and you look at where the family trees intersect at a common ancestor. And that tells you what side of the family that, that, uh, uh, that you need to look at. And then by identifying that common ancestor, if you trace all the living descendants, then one of those is going to be the, um, the soldier. You know, so you will be able to see from uh, or, or it'll be the adoptee's biological mother or biological father. And you can use exactly the same technique to identify soldiers. And to help the, the process, myself and a couple of um, colleagues set up uh, a commemorating the missing website to try and um, publicize this genetic genealogy technique, but also to try and create a genealogical memorial for these missing soldiers as well as a genetic memorial for these missing soldiers. And we have actually set up a database which is completely free, open to the public, and what we did was uh, my colleague Michelle Leonard went and copied every single name on every single um, memorial, Chepval, all of those memorials, and put them into the database, and then my colleague Donna Rutherford set the whole thing up so that it could be searched. So this is the database of all of the missing soldiers, all 526,000 of them. And the idea here is for creating this genealogical memorial, and anyone can do this, you know, I think would be a great, um, a great project for local history societies, family history societies, 
even local Re Royal British Legion societies as well, to get involved in picking one of these missing soldiers, building a family tree for that missing soldier, and then planting that family tree on the Everyone Remembered website. And if you want to include DNA information, because maybe you've tested some yourself or members of your family, then that can be included on the Everyone Remembered website also. And this is an example of uh, what it looks like. So we have the patient's ID, uh, the pa the, sorry, the soldier's ID, his name. The soldier is Edward Henry Lucking, patient. Um, he died in France. His date of death was eight. 1918. He was aged 19. He was a rifleman. There's a service number and his uh, data was collected from the Posiers Memorial. You can see the Ypres, the men in gate down there as well and various other memorials. So you know, maybe you could search for your own surname and see how many soldiers of your surname are still missing in action from World War One. This is an example of one of my own family members. Um, this one was Michael Spiram. He died at the age of 19. He was with the Royal Dublin Fusiliers. And I've left a genealogical memorial for him, even though he's not one of the missing, but I used him as an example of what a genealogical memorial could look like. And I've written a little bit of a blurb about him, just a brief description of who he was, where he came from, and underlined there in the middle, I have left a link to his family tree that anyone can access. So if he was one of the missing and someone was trying to find out, um, uh, trying to find his family, the work has already been done. The genealogical work of building that family tree has already been done and that is saving people a lot of time. Now I've also left information about uh, various relatives of his that have done a DNA test and you can see that um, his uh, paternal first cousin has done a DNA test, and that is um, uh, the kit number, and it's on Family Tree DNA. And there is the kit number for Y-Search. So that's an example of a genealogical memorial and a genetic memorial. And this commemorating the missing uh, website is a subset of the 1.1 million people who died that are on the Everyone Remembered website, and that is, in turn, is a subset of the 8 million people who are documented on the Lives of the First World War website. So, hopefully, the work that uh, we've done building this database, but also, hopefully in the near future, we'll have genetic genealogy techniques coming in to, work, to um, help us identify some of these soldiers, so that we uh, eventually will be able to convert this type of gravestone here, of a soldier known unto God, to this type of gravestone here, where you have the soldier's name and all of his information, so that he's given the dignity of, having, of being identified in death. And I think it's well worth doing, <clears throat> because we have previously said that at the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. So thank you very much for your kind attention. So there may be a few questions that... Yeah, sure. So, uh, yes, we have a question down here. So you said there were 800 women soldiers that were found, that were unidentified. If uh, they're women, you can't trace the Y... Chromosome, that's correct. Chromosome, so it's, how do you find their relatives? Well, you'd only have, you'd only have the mitochondrial DNA to use in right. women, but if you're using then the third line of approach, genetic genealogy, the autosomal DNA would be very helpful in those situations. But the 800 women were, were women who died or were killed in action during World War I. They're not necessarily missing. Um, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know enough about those 800 women. So that would be a very interesting project to find out, you know, who were these 800 women and, and what did they do? I suspect that they weren't frontline soldiers. I suspect that they might have been in the back room uh, 
nurses perhaps as well. Am ambulance drivers. Ambulance drivers, yes, absolutely. So, yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, it's an interesting question. Has anybody here got uh, relatives who were missing in action from World War One? No. But probably, well, I know, Ian, you have, it was your father, your father fought in World War One. Anybody else have relatives who fought in World War One? You've got three? All three came back. And grandfather on both sides. Grandfather on both sides. Wow. Okay. He should be on a database. Oh, yeah. What, what, um, what was the name? Right, but they they they're not on the they're not missing in action, are they? No, no, they they came they were they came back. They would be on the lives of the First World War uh, website um, because they are people who fought in World War One, and that's the lives of the First World War website. Great. Cool. Any more questions? No, that was fascinating. Good. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.